Well, hello and welcome to this Farm Farmers Union of Wales rural, rural Housing webinar, Tackling the Rural Housing Crisis. As Gareth says, my name is Abby Kay. I'm Chief Reporter at Farmers Guardian magazine, and I'm going to be chair for this event. Now, I know I don't have to tell any of you that rural communities across the UK have been under pressure due to second home ownership and related effects for decades, especially in honeypot areas like national parks. But the coronavirus pandemic has accelerated this trend, causing rapid house price inflation and placing rural houses even further beyond the financial reach of rural and agricultural communities. In this seminar, we'll hear about the problems and experiences in different parts of Wales and the UK and explore solutions that are more imaginative than simply building more houses. Each of our three fantastic speakers, who I'll introduce one by one, will give a short presentation before a Q&A discussion. So as Gareth says, please do get your questions in using that Q&A function. Now I must give a little disclaimer as well before I begin. I'm obviously not a Welsh speaker, so please do accept my apologies if I don't get some name or place name pronunciations quite right. Now our first speaker is Dovrig Schenkin, co-chair of the Welsh Local Government Association Rural Forum and leader of Gwynedd County Council. Dovrig was born and bred in Dolgethi and spent most of his career as a chartered surveyor and auctioneer with the Farmers Mars Cooperative Auctioneer Company. He was chief executive of the company from 1988 until he was appointed Plaid Cymru Deputy Leader, to, Leader of Gwynedd Council in 2014. In 2017, he was elected by the Plaid Group of County Councillors to be Plaid Cymru's Gwynedd Leader and Leader of County Council. His current roles include Vice Chair of the North Wales Ambition Board, Co-Chair of the Welsh Local Government Association Rural Forum, Chair of the Trules Renouth Overview Board and Vice Chair of the Gwynedd and Anglesey Public Services Board. So Govrig, the floor is yours. That's with that. Diolch am y gwahoddiad yma hynna, felly mae bob amser yn bleser pyr gobeithio bod y cyfieithu yn gweithio gyda rhaw. Mae bob amser yn... It's always a pleasure to be part of the activities of the Farmers Union of Wales. And I'm glad to be proud that I'm actually a member of the FUW. So I certainly have an interest in the work of the union and I've done a lot with the union and also other organizations over the years. The phenomenon of second homes in rural Wales is nothing new, of course. We remember back in the 1970s, I remember being part of protests at that time. And also a large number of protests were held some 20 years ago. And now, of course, we are in a situation was quite different to the situation which we were in years ago. There has been a significant increase in the numbers of second homes. Here in Gwynedd, we have around 11% of the housing stock. It's the largest percentage of second homes in Wales. And of course, we've also seen this new factor in this area, which has means an enormous increase in the use of Airbnbs. And it's hard to know, actually, just how many of those exist. But I am very aware that Airbnbs have increased significantly in the housing market, as it is now possible for someone to buy a home as an investment and to let it quite easily. And I can actually see that on the street where I live. The small cottages in my town are more or less all of them are being bought in order to become, not to be um, bought as homes, but as homes to be let at a short let. And that, of course, has a serious effect on the nature of society on those streets. Now, here in Cangor Gwynedd, we commissioned uh, planning policy officers to do some research work in this field in order to collate information and collate data and to look at ways of trying to manage, certainly in the short term lease of homes, which in my opinion is the factor when it comes or one of the factors why house prices have increased recently. We had a report which was submitted to the cabinet in December 
And from that report, we adopted some five or six, if I can remember correctly, five or six recommendations. And then we identified three, which the Welsh government would actually implement quite easily without much delay, which in our opinion would have an effect on the housing market directly. The planning officers, by the way, are continuing to do some research work. I'm aware that they've done some work recently on plan the new planning conditions and the effect of those, and some further reports will come with regards to that before long. So a great deal of work has already been undertaken. Following that meeting that was held in December, a letter was then sent to the Welsh local government minister drawing attention to this problem and suggesting some of the adaptations that to legislation that could be made. We had quite a positive response to that correspondence and a few of them came to meet us, but of course that did not take place because of the election. Directly after the election, we then wrote the four counties in the west of Wales, then sent a letter asking for a meeting with the minister and the rural for forum. The rural forum has been discussing the field of housing. There's an agreement actually amongst the nine members of that rural forum with regards to our housing manifesto. And we have held some meetings with the minister in order to express our opinions on that point. The three recommendations that we believe will have a direct um, action and which can be implemented directly. Firstly, the licensing um, of short-term lets. So there would be advantages from that and also from the point of view of the tourism industry, we could give some guidance on standards with regards to those homes. And I think that we could actually include in that licensing that local authorities could actually place a cap on numbers. We also believe that it would be quite easy to have a specific class of use when it comes to short-term lets. Very similar to the classification that we currently have for HMOs, homes that have a number of people who actually live in them. And we've used that right in the city of Bangor, for example, in order to, to limit the number of homes that were being allocated for those purposes. And then lastly, and not least by a long ways to adapt section 66 of the Local Government Act, so that any annex would be taxed under the council tax and would be unable to transfer as a business tax. And if they transferred to a business tax, of course, that they avoid paying any tax whatsoever. And we do believe that this is an important element. And it requires secondary or subsidiary legislation. And it would draw back into the taxation system thousands of homes, which have been handed over as business properties in order to avoid paying business tax. It would also permit local authorities to raise a premium. And that premium is an extremely important to us because we as an authority have also published a housing action plan, which is worth 77 million pounds over the coming five years and 23 million of that expenditure would come out of the second home premium. So it is an extremely important part of an income which we should actually be receiving in order to put right the housings that we are losing from the housing stock. And just to, to give you some more evidence with regards to that last point regarding what's happening, I saw some figures over this last few weeks from our planning department, we in Gwynedd have around 61,000, around that number of annexes, we have all dwellings. 
Over the past four years, during our the, our new the period of our new local development plan, some six hundred new homes have been built. But the numbers of those dwellings, which are used as homes or as a main home, has actually decreased from to by two hundred. So there's been a loss of over almost nine hundred dwellings in Gwynedd, which have now been lost and they have now become homes that are let in the short term. So I think that just proves the real need for action. And to put it in a wider context, an important context, actually, I received some figures yesterday with regards to the number of homeless people in Gwynedd. And it's we have close to 500 people who are homeless here in Gwynedd. Now, you would have thought in a rural area, you wouldn't have thought that there is any homelessness. We don't see people, we don't see many people sleeping rough on our streets, for example, in our market towns, for example. With the cotton. But it has increased significantly during the COVID period. And it's now reached crisis point, in my opinion. We are having difficulty in finding a place for them. And of course, there are people there who have problems, but also there are people who have fallen to that unfortunate place due to circumstances beyond of their control. I heard the other day about a mother and a daughter who are having to sleep on their friends' sofas. Well, we have to be able to respond to that. And of course, the problem with regards to um, second homes contributes to that. There are insufficient number of homes in the area and they are being used as second homes, which is a luxury, of course. And whilst there are people who, on the one hand, are homeless, it's immoral that we have such a significant increase in the number of second homes. I leave it there for now, and I will be open to questions. Thank you. Thanks very much, Javrik. That was really interesting. A lot of points that um, I'm sure we're going to want to discuss further. If it's OK, I'm going to take questions for all three speakers at the end. So next up, we will have Tim Farron. Tim is Liberal Democrat spokesperson for the Environment, Food and Rural Affairs and MP for Westmoreland and Lonsdale in Cumbria. Tim has served as the MP for Westmoreland and Lonsdale for 16 years. From 2015 to 2017, he was the leader of the Liberal Democrats and he's now their spokesperson for housing as well as Environment, Food and Rural Affairs. Prior to the COVID-19 pandemic, second home ownership in Tim's constituency covering the Lake District and Yorkshire Dales National Parks was common but the last 16 months have seen an explosion in holiday lets and Airbnbs, which threaten the future of rural communities in these areas. To resolve the crisis, he has proposed a package of policy changes to government. These include making holiday lets a separate category of planning use, giving local authorities the power to determine the proportion of local housing that may be sold as second homes, and offering to pilot the new first homes programme. So Tim's going to give us his perspective on the rural housing crisis from his constituency in England. Over to you, Tim. Cheers, Abby. Thanks for having us. And um, it really is to hear uh, Dubig's uh, comments earlier on, which I think you know, match many of our experiences here. Um, so, a huge thank you to the FUW, by the way. Um, been a pleasure to work with them in the in the past. Uh, uh, I'm obviously not a Welsh speaker. My head of office is um, German, but a Aberystwyth student, graduate, and um, uh, and uh, allegedly a fluent Welsh speaker. Uh, she tells me, by the way, that Westmerian dialect passes is bears more than a passing resemblance to uh, to Welsh, but I couldn't tell you. <laughs> but there you go. But anyway, so it's a massive honour to be with you and to, yeah, I guess, we'll stand in solidarity. Very, very similar issues um, uh, that we we face. As Abby says, I mean, Cumbria is a interesting place. Obviously, you've got the big city of Carlisle in the north, right on the border. Um, but we contain all of the Lake District National Park and actually a big chunk of the Yorkshire Dales, the most populated bit of the Dales is actually in Cumbria. Um, and then outside of that, just as in Wales, lots of beautiful places that just aren't in a national park, but they're nevertheless affected. And 
you know, we, we can talk about second homes and Hawley Lets, and I think we, we often do quite rightly talk about them as two separate entities. They are two separate entities. And very often, you know, as somebody who wants to stand up for the hospitality and tourism industry, being squeamish about being too critical about the Hawley Let side of things and focused upon excessive second home ownership. Let's talk about Let's in a moment. But and um, second home ownership, again, it could be really, really careful about the language that we use. I in, in no way want to ever sound like that we're being judgmental or condemnatory about people, whatever their tenure, um, you know, people are allowed to buy a second home, I guess, and all the rest of it. But my job, surely, is to defend the interests of people who can barely afford a first, uh, if at all. And we can't deny the evidence of our eyes, which is that excessive second home ownership in a community kills the community. And if you've got a, a, a place like Coniston, well-known um, uh, village in my constituency, with something like, you know, 750, 800 properties in it, and just over half of them are not lived in all year round. Of course, that's going to have an impact on the number of kids who go to the local school, um, the demand for the bus service all year round, for you know pubs and uh, and ho post offices and, and all the rest of it. You know, you've got a, a, a doctor's surgery there with a uh, a list of about nine hundred patients. It makes the, all those sort of um, services untenable. And and so whatever we think about. Um, you know, the individuals, and we, we have to be welcoming and kind and gracious towards them, excessive second home ownership kills um, communities. There's a, a, a village called Satterthwaite in my, my patch, which lost its school it's about 12, 13 years ago now. Uh, and when they knocked the school down, uh, they built a bunch of affordable houses there for local people. The enormous irony, that if only they built those houses somewhere else in the village beforehand, that school would never have closed. So there is an issue about sustainability. Uh, of communities when there are so many houses in them that are just not providing a uh, a full-time population. Now, a, a tiny little, tiny little um, current of positivity, despite all the other negatives, is that better broadband, and indeed COVID, and the realisation that you can work in a nice place or live in a nice place and earn a living, um, and indeed that you know, we're in a world of work where that might be more acceptable means that against the tide of us losing homes, the second home market, we're seeing a little bit, little bit, still a massive net loss, but a little bit of people um, deciding that they can make a living somewhere attractive and rural. But let's be honest and make a living. Let's be honest. These are fairly wealthy people. Um, yes, it's better that those houses are not empty. But we're not really looking at the Lake District, the Yorkshire Dales being an accessible place. And, you know, a quick comment about the nature of national parks. The ideal behind the national parks is that it meant these absolutely beautiful places um, are preserved in terms of their landscape and their heritage, but also for their communities. And what a, you know, we, I, I'm very aware that the lakes and the dales, we're kind of looking after it for future generations and for the rest of um, society. You know, we might live here, but we welcome others to visit. How outrageous it would be if those these places become just unaffordable, uh, inaccessible, not just people to live, but even to visit. Now, second home numbers, we can only take a stab at because, um, I mean, what, what I'm bound, someone's going to say this, I don't know, no one's going to. Uh, one of the things the coalition did right was get rid of the council tax subsidy. Um, for second homeowners. So there's now no incentive in England at least to register as a second home because you get nothing off. And therefore we're taking a guess at the number of second homes we actually have uh, in our community. The best guess is at least one in seven houses is a second home and that's not counting the holiday lets. Of course, um, as has just been said, the pandemic has turbocharged the problem. Um, Again, it's all anecdotal, but I've talked to a range of estate agents uh, around Cumbria and the best guess is something like 60, 65 percent on average, up to 80 percent of all house sales in the last 15 months have been to the second home market. And definitely the stamp duty holiday fueled that, you know, um, it was a thing that may have done some good in some parts of the economy, it caused enormous damage in fueling a problem that already existed in places like like ours. So that problem's got worse. But let's talk about holiday lets because uh, the reality is that most houses that go into the second home market were too expensive for most people in the local community to start off with. It's still a, a bad thing that there are so many because it robs a community of full-time population. But what's really had an impact on the housing tenure this last 12 months, and in particular the last five or six, has been this 
cascade from the private rented sector into the holiday let and in particular the Airbnb sector. So you can imagine that in South Lakeland, the district that I'm my constituency is fully within um, in South Lake, which includes most of the population of the Lake District. And as I said, the most populated bits, the Yorkshire Dales, you can imagine there are already a ton of holiday lets to start off with. There were. And that number has risen by 32 percent in one year, in one year. And so typically what's happened is that that's your hard figures. Anecdotally, as I go knocking on doors and just standing on you know, marketplaces and listening to people. And you know, what's happening is that people who could never have got themselves onto the social housing list, but couldn't afford um, to be owner occupiers, cling on in the community with a private rented property. And typically they're being turfed out uh, now that the eviction ban is over and they are in a position where they find that the property they thought was their home is now on Airbnb for 800 pounds a week or a thousand pounds a week. And that has happened in a colossal way. Now, there are a variety of different things we could do about it. But fundamentally, it's got so extreme, we have to do something about it now. I am um, uh, envious of um, government, national and local within Wales, where you've clearly attempted to do some things about this. And some of it is, um, uh, is working and some of it is too early to tell. But what you can't be faulted for is at least having a go. I don't, the only thing that the Westminster government has really done is to close at least technically the loophole that allows people who have a second home that isn't really a holiday let to pretend it's a holiday let and claim business rates relief as a consequence. Um, they've closed that loophole. We'll see if it actually is being enforced. Otherwise, nothing's happening. And I think there are two obvious things we can do. And I'm all ears for other ideas as well. The first is one which involves the planning um, law and Abby set it out. So I don't need to more than a few seconds telling you what that would be. And that is we should change planning so that holiday lets and second homes always count as a as separate categories of planning use and give power to local planning authorities, national parks or district councils um, to be able to say a flat no um, to any such application, particularly in places which are already over overrun with such properties. And the second thing is to do something which I know has, um, has been said has been done in Wales already, and that's to give local authorities the power to charge significantly greater levels of council tax than than is the case for, you know, first homeowners. A, that would do a job, hopefully, of dissuading some people um, from having second homes and, and holiday lets in certain areas. But it would also um, at least provide some kind of an income. We worked out, by the way, that in Coniston alone, you could raise close to a million pounds in council tax just from at one village. Uh, and what would you do with that money? Well, lots of things you could do. One is to subsidize the schools that might otherwise close because they haven't got enough kids out of them and um, because there are too many second homes in a community. I think if the government did those things, I think it would have an impact. It would also go some way to convincing rural communities that they're not having their interests overlooked. And the final thing is we have to use um, resources nationally and locally to develop genuinely affordable affordable homes, shared ownership, um, social rented, that we can guarantee will remain in the affordable bracket for generations uh, to come. Otherwise, we're in a situation where, you know, I've, I've likened it and I, I don't, I hope it's not offensive to say it, but, you know, what, what were the Highland clearances about? They were about people deciding, wealthy people who own the land, deciding that they could make more money uh, by clearing the people who live there for something else. Well, that happened to be sheep. For us, um, it's clearing out effectively local people because you can make more money out of tourists and that market. Talking to Cumbria Tourism, our excellent um, uh, direct marketing organisation for tourism in Cumbria, they're very clear. We've got enough accommodation. We like to fill it over the winter. We've got enough accommodation because they know um, there's no value to the tourism economy to basically cannibalise everything else around. Because where does your workforce come from if they've got nowhere to afford to live? And so I think it's time for a radical set of proposals that will uh, tackle this problem. And if you know, they say don't waste a good crisis, things have got so bad in the last 12 months that perhaps, just perhaps, the government might be shocked, the UK government might be shocked into doing something radical about a problem that has just got radically worse. Thanks very much, Tim. Some, some really thoughtful insights there. Just a reminder before we go any further that you can submit your questions using the Q&A function. So make sure you get those in and we'll take them after our third speaker. Our third speaker is Ruth Tadir, Nevin Town Council Chair and Local Housing Campaigner. Ruth graduated with a degree in Law and Accounting and later qualified as a Police Office Representative and Court Duty Solicitor. 
He has worked as a solicitor in Anglesey and Gwynedd. He is passionate about protecting people who suffer injustice. His main interests are politics and working to keep rural communities viable and prosperous. He loves to run and read, and his heroes are J.R. Jones, Anurin Bevan, Kia Hardy, and Emrys Abgiwan. He is a campaigner and part of the Haulivu Agri movement. He is also a councillor and chairman of Nevin Town Council and a member of the Karenbuch Male Voice Choir. Reese is going to give us an idea of how he thinks the rural housing crisis can be resolved. So over to you, Reese. Thank you, Abby. Um, yes, I am a member of Nevin Town Council and have been for a number of years. We are an active uh, community council and town council. We are a young group. With an average age, I would say, of being 50 or younger, and I think that we're probably younger than any other town community council throughout Wales. There are four of us actually who are aged 30 or younger, and we're also a community council as well as a town council. We've had a number of proposals that relate to the housing crisis, encouraging the powers above us to act and to act with urgency, and not just to encourage them to do something that will help, but to encourage them to introduce specific measures. We've corresponded with the government relentlessly, and we've also corresponded with Mark Drakeford. We had a virtual meeting with him on Zoom, and that was back in November, and that may show that we do, people are listening to us. The town council have also turned to protesting as well. A number of us councillors are part of a group, and the campaigning group, the right to live at home. The right to live locally. It's a simple slogan, a slogan which is a positive expression of our aspiration, of our dream to live locally. And it shouldn't actually be a dream. You should have a right to live locally. Everyone should have that right. But at the moment, there is no right for communities to continue as living communities for future generations. It's reached crisis point. The housing market is going beyond the grasp of local people. And what we are seeing that homes, detached homes, they've always been people's dream for people who live locally because something that we can never actually reach. And if I turn um, to the words of Canaan, the poet, then there's no hope, really, to have be able to live on a village, you know, in a village, um, on a coastal region, to live in the community, which are in an area of the coastal region and an area of, of um, beauty. There's no hope of being able to afford those homes, even terraced houses are going. There's a home in Morvanevin, for example, it's called Tea Cleed, two-bedroom home. There isn't a space to park in front of the home and it's on the market and it's been sold for a quarter of a million, which is totally unreasonable. So that won't be a home for a local person. It, it's impossible. That will be a second home. And that's the pattern that we are seeing. Terrace houses, homes in the middle of villages, and right in the centre of our villages being sold as second homes. The younger generation have been closed out of it, closed out of their communities. Another example of the density as well, a bungalow, for example, in a new estate, as it happens in Morvan Evin, sold for 650,000. The price is totally unreasonable, a new estate. And it brings us, I think, to the subject of the debate this evening for alternative answers to the housing crisis, which doesn't just mean building homes. The truth is we can't build ourselves, we can't build ourselves out of this crisis. Local people need, it's the planning process is slow, and also when you live in rural areas, you don't want to have the rural areas to be overdeveloped, otherwise there'll be house after house after house. And as I've already mentioned, Morvanevin, there's a new home there, but there's no certainty that that will be a home for um, local people. 
Aggression building homes isn't a solution. It makes sense in populated urban areas, but it does not make sense for our rural communities. It doesn't make sense to build too many homes in our rural areas. And the emphasis from the government and also local authorities and our local authority in Gwynedd, they have a local development plan to build 8,000 homes. But that, in my opinion, is not fit for purpose. You are seeing projects to fund this building. It takes a lot of money. And also you're having housing associations. And who are now um, engines to make money. They just then overtake the ability. So what we actually need, we need alternative ways solutions. We, on the one hand, need to limit the number of second homes, and on the other hand, we need to boost and help the local people to be able to buy one. How can we do that? You may ask. Well, firstly, you have to set a limit that prohibits people who are not local from buying a second home, from buying an additional home in those communities that are protected. In Switzerland, for example, you have two pieces of legislation that protects local people, and there they have legislation that stops people from coming in from buying homes, and they also have strict control on the buying of second homes, and they promote sustainable tourism. And tourism there is on a larger scale, significantly larger scale than what we have here in our rural areas. But it's a sustainable healthy tourism. The two Lex pieces of legislation Lex is Lex Verba and Lex Collar, and that's their title. And similar legislation needs to be adopted here. And what we need to do here, we need to have a limit. Unless you are local, and if you're trying to buy a second home or an additional home, then you shouldn't be allowed to do that. You will not be given a land transaction and tax certificate. If you bought when the limit is in place, then you could be fine. As they say, it would be null and void if you bought under those circumstances. That's the silver bullet. I must say, with regards to these, this crisis, there's no silver bullet, really, but that certainly will help. This rhetoric that there is no silver bullet is nonsense. Much of that is driven by civil servants who are based in Cardiff. Unfortunately, in Wales, we do also have another stumbling block. We don't have our own civil servants. The civil service is a British civil service. We don't have our own Welsh civil service that looks at the needs of Wales. And we have to need a civil service. We need solicitors who need understand the needs of Wales and understand the language and its needs. We need civil servants who understand the importance of community and neighbourhood, because at the moment they don't understand that. If we had such a civil service that understands the importance of society, then we'd find a solution to the problem. So that's the rocket, I think, which will make a difference. Not just a silver bullet, it will make a difference. A lot of research has been undertaken on limiting on second homes by putting obstacles um, with regards to the planning in place. If you're using a home as the second home, as a holiday home, then you have to have a planning um, application to do that, but you could quite easy to overcome that because you could actually state that's your main dwelling and who's actually going to police it, whether it's your main dwelling or not. Even if the local authority had all of the resources in the world, all of the officers they, they could want, an, an army of them looking at the dwellings, then they would be unable to monitor. You'd have to be there on a daily basis to see whether they are significantly using the dwelling during the year. It's impossible to monitor. But what you can do through a land transaction tax, anyone who's local is trying to buy an additional home in a community where they are not local to, then they would be stopped from doing that, and land transaction certificate would not be given. And that's the limit that we need. 
They do it in Europe, and not just in Switzerland. They do similar things in Denmark, also in New Zealand. Why can't we do something similar here? I think we have to start doing something new. There are strong foundations in areas that have tourism on a wider scale. The second solution we have is the land tax on second homes. It needs to be significantly increased. The Welsh Government, as a result of increasing pressure by campaigning groups such as the Right to Live locally, have actually brought the land transaction tax and have increased that recently. That needs to be trebled. And if you placed a, um, a limit when buying a home, a second home, then it's possible to do that. And then, as they know that the limit will come to existence, then they will think, well, we better sell the house now. And people will continue to do that. So what you will then do, you need to increase the land transaction tax as soon as possible. And if you increase it sufficiently, it will make a difference. Because similarly in Nevin, people could buy a terrace home that has no view and let it as an Airbnb. The price may be some 200,000, for example. And if you put a tax of some 20% on a second home, then that tax would be 40,000 on that home. But you'd be out of pocket before you even start. You then wouldn't buy that home as a second home. It wouldn't make an investment for you because you would be taxed on it. So that's one solution. Then the third solution, when it comes to accommodation and holiday, then criteria need to be set, strict criteria. Letting a home for 70 days a year is not enough. A holiday accommodation should actually be in with significant turnover, such as you have in a hotel. So we need a new body. And such as well, you, such you have with Rent Smart Wales, you need to create a new body for self catering accommodation in Wales. And that body would then take responsibility that every property that a holiday let or holiday accommodation would actually reach these new criteria that would be set. I think over 200 days a year in order for a home to be a holiday let or even more than that. And what that body would then do? They would ask homeowners who claim that they are letting the home, can we see our logbook? Can we see who has been staying in our home during that year? And also the national insurance uh, number as well. Can we have their phone numbers and their addresses? Can we ask for how long did they stay there? in order to see which homes are actually frauding the system. And that would decrease the burden on local authorities who are having difficulty, and it's impossible as it is, to actually to see which homes are actually frauding the system. And all local authorities would then have to do, they'd have to tell these people, right, you have a self-catering accommodation license, and if they don't, then they won't be exempt from the council tax. So every home would have to pay council tax right from the outset, at the beginning of the year. And then they would have a rebate if they actually fit into these strict criteria and actually show that they are actually holiday let. So the next thing that we need to do in order to improve our communities is help to buy. We need to boost in order to get people to be able to get on the property ladder, to be able to compete. The Welsh Government have already have a pioneering scheme, Home by Wales, that's the title of the scheme, and it's a pioneering scheme. It's a scheme where the Welsh Government will fund up to 30% of the home's equity without an interest. So there's no better scheme. It doesn't cost anything for the buyer. And the government won't lose out either because its equity will increase with the price of the home. 
llawer mwy sylweddol ohono fo. We need to make bo. better use um, of it. Chi'n gweld yn, yn Gwyneb, bwyddyn dweitha. You can see in Gwyneb last year, I thought it was a disaster actually. Only five homes were actually made use of that. And the emphasis is always on building homes rather than... The emphasis is always on building homes rather than boosting or helping the local people to get on the property ladder. I'll give you an example. But the price of one social home you could actually have 10 plans for the help to buy. That's the value of that sort of scheme. And not only does it mean that there's been expenditure, but it's also the actual investment in the true sense of the word. The money will, at the end of the day, will be more than what you actually put in. So when buying or building the homes, it's expenditure, it's not investment, which will grow in its value. So to have greater emphasis on help to buy schools, and specifically in rural areas. Because I feel quite frustrated, actually, but unfortunately, within this county, our housing action plans, it's money from the premium on second homes. And that money is being used on social housing rather than help to buy schemes. Gwynedd Council has given a promise to build 100 units with the help to buy scheme when their new housing action plan. But that's an action plan that will take 10 years. So we're only talking about 10 homes which I think is totally insufficient. So that's one solution, the help to buy. We need to make wider use of it. We need to limit on the people's ability to buy second homes, but also we need to help others to buy. I think the government and the local authorities also need to roll up their sleeves and they need a vision and they need to act. We are seeing this from one week to another here in Gwynedd, that we have a leadership who are reluctant to do anything radical. We are seeing planning applications coming in from one week to the next. In Gwynedd, there's an application to, to, bring, to take down a home and then to build a new one, to double or to triple the amount of homes. The officers in the local authority are recommending for people to follow the legislation. Councillors, county councillors in the planning committee are passing a scheme which is harmful to their area. So please pass this. And what do the councillors do? They're opposed to it because it's harmful to their communities. And what I'm disheartened about is that there's lack of leadership that actually voices the imbalance that exists between the legislation that does not help local people. And that's what's needed. The leadership needs to voice and strongly voice that the legislation does not work for local people, so it needs to be changed. We can't keep on keeping um, receiving applications from one week to another. There's a local development plan in Gwynedd, and it needs to be changed with urgency. And I do feel, think that the local authority has now decided to do this, and lots of things need to be changed. We've spoken about farmers who are unable to turn their barns, for example, into a home for their family. But they can turn it into a holiday accommodation, which is ridiculous. My message to local authorities would be, when you go to Mark Drakeford and lobby him in order to put the radical legislation in place, then please look after your own home first. We need to revolutionise attitudes and the cabinets of our local authorities here. Building homes will not work alone. And it won't help the Welsh language. Perhaps in a number of years, we will be given the right to live locally. There may be regulations in place in the future and hopefully in the near future, perhaps in the far future, to give local people homes. But with regards to the language, if there's a delay, 
then the harm uh, that will be done to the Irish language and the fact that language and community go together could actually bring the language to an end. If we lose the language in a community, and we're beginning to see this happening on, at a scale, when a community loses its language, it will lose it forever. So it's a crisis in itself. Within campaigning groups throughout Wales, this is not a linguistic debate, it's a housing debate. But please don't forget about the language. It would be stupid to do that. The Welsh language, I think, backs up our argument for urgent action. It also intensifies the argument. You have a housing problem, and Tim Farron is here this evening, who lives in Cumbria, and the people are suffering the same there, also in Cornwall, from seeing the prices in Cornwall, and the percentage of second homes is probably even more intense than what's happening here in Gwynedd and Wales. But what makes it even more harmful for us is the linguistic element. Not only are we losing our communities and are unable to live there, we're losing our identity, we're losing our history that exists between ourselves and the land. And so we need to take action with urgency. And to do that without fear, we need to put measures in place and to encourage the government to put radical measures in place. They're not actually radical, they are measures that are just. They are just. And we need to push those just measures tirelessly and without fear. And it's something that we have to do, otherwise our language and our culture and our communities will end. <laughs> That's it, that's all I have to say, and I'm grateful to you all for listening. I think, I know I was quite passionate at the end, but thank you for listening. Thanks so much, Risa. Really impassioned talk there and lots to talk about. Uh, we've had some really good questions coming in, so keep those coming if you have any more. Um, I'm going to start with this one. Isn't the real issue the low incomes of rural people which places rural houses beyond their financial reach rather than people buying houses from further away? Shouldn't we really be concentrating on tackling rural poverty? And will the reductions in direct farm support already started in England and soon to start in Wales make rural poverty worse? Um, Dothrig, I'm going to come to you first on that one, please. Yeah, Dr. Yes, question. Yes, thank you. I don't know whether I've understood the question in full. So it's about um, the discussion, isn't the real issue, the fact that people living in rural areas don't earn enough money? Yeah, yeah. Do you have a point? Um, I, I, yes, you know, I understand the point. And to a certain extent, there is truth in that statement. And it's part of the problem that we have in rural areas. We are aware that areas such as Marion and Duivor have low incomes, perhaps the lowest incomes in the country, if not further afield. So it is a factor. But of course, there are things that we can do, and we have already highlighted some things that we can do in order to try and take control of the housing market. I have to say, I agree with much of what Rhys has said, but, but I am, um, unfortunately, he has criticised the local authority that has been pioneering and has done some work with on behalf of its residents. So I am saddened that he has turned on his friend rather than actually working with us. Tim, do you have another question? I, mean, I think it's a it's an absolutely accurate um, again representation of the problem. In, in a sense, you've got you've got two problems that are connected: excessive house costs and a lack of availability and the fact that so many of them are uh, of the properties in areas like all of ours that we're talking about now uh, are not lived in all year round and it's become exclusive on the other hand yes wages in rural communities are getting less and less i think there's a what can we do about it i think there are a number of things uh, one of which is as, as i said we talk about um, the nature of employment in rural communities being quite different to urban ones but actually, maybe the world is moving in our favour. 
So better and better broadband, which is, by the way, not universal. Um, when Whenever you see governments talking about 95% connectivity, you know exactly where the 5% is. And it's in the kind of places that we are um, from. Um, so we can't be complacent, but nevertheless, there's been significant movement over the last 10 years or so towards better and better broadband. COVID has increased people's sense, if you're lucky, and it's not the case for every profession by any means or every workplace, but the possibility um, of being able to work from home and hopefully seeing employers realise they can trust their employees to work from home, it might well mean that it's possible to earn a living and to live, you know, away from a significant away from a major population centre. That is still a bit of a middle class thing. Uh, to say the least, you know, it never, it might still fill some homes. It still might mean that, you know, the likes of Coniston might have, you know, 45% second home ownership rather than 55% second home ownership. It's a bit better. And um, the more we can do to connect and future proof our communities to proper, you know, gigabit um, ready uh, broadband fibre to the premises everywhere, the more you're going to make these places more ac uh, accessible. But it also means look, this is a market problem. And therefore, if you just leave it to the market, we will not have a solution. People with plenty of money will live the lives they want. Everybody else will be forced out in all the ways that De Vrigg and Reese very rightly and very passionately spoken of. And so I think we have got to intervene and do things that are going to make a difference. And that does mean, you know, governments in Wales, uh, in, in Cardiff and in London, making a deliberate decision to invest in rural communities and recognise it's not just... Um, broadband communications, fiber communications. It's also about rail and road and other um, things as well that we're going to make these places. You know, there's this great, I mean, one sense, I'm very lucky where I am. You know, I'm at the south end of Cumbria, I'm 15 minutes drive away from the main mainline railway station. But that's not the case in most of the Lake District. And that connectivity um, is there thanks to investment made in Victorian times, not anything that happened recently so how ambitious can we be but no, i think it's absolutely right and i think that's why we've got to slowly but surely well hopefully not slowly but you know d drive up uh, wages hospitality and tourism is traditionally not a well-paid industry um and uh, you know we're seeing in our area of masses another another issue here but uh, the issue of the visa rules on the one hand and the lack of affordable housing for anybody local on the other is meant that the reservoir such as there was of talent to work in the hospitality and tourism industry here is well and truly drying up. So, you know, industry has got to pay much higher wages to have any chance now, but many of them simply can't afford it. So it's it's cyclical, really. Um, but I think recognising that, recognising that a much higher proportion of people earning their living in rural communities will be self-employed or working from small employers and therefore advantaging them and taking people with skills and helping them to become business people to use those skills. That's something we need to be investing in in a very real and hands-on way. But no, the observation is correct. It's, you know, you can create lots of affordable housing, but one of the reasons why the housing is not affordable is because the wages are so low. Reese, do you have any thoughts on that? Is, is rural poverty the real issue here? Yes, it just um, adding to what Tim um, um, said, just a tick yet, and they're far away. Yes, I'll just add um, to what Tim has just said. With affordable homes, the concern that I have, as Devrig has mentioned, is that people's income is so low, even affordable housing is out of people's reach. And you can see the percentage of affordable house compared to the housing department is normally about 80%, but it's way out of people's reach. People who are trying to buy um, homes in places such as the coastal areas, such as Morvanevin and Abersoch. These affordable um, homes are on the market. What we unfortunately have is that our economy in our rural areas is overemphasised on unsustainable tourism more than anything else. In Switzerland, they have far better models. There, they have control on market prices in some places and in some areas that correspond to the counties that we have here in Wales. Then detached homes are not allowed to become second homes or second or holiday homes. What they do have in areas they, where they have ski resorts, what people can actually get as they have holiday flats, they won't be allowed to buy a home. And and certainly they won't be allowed to buy a detached home. So I think that's turned on its head with us. We can only dream of having a detached home.
It's impossible in our rural areas to be able to buy. We've been pushed out, totally pushed out of communities. So somehow or another, we need to overturn and do what they've done in Switzerland. So it's possible for people to have flats in order to go on holiday in and not to come on holiday in the coastal region in a detached. That's supposed to be a home for them. So the market needs to be changed, and then the prices can be controlled. As you limit the number of second homes, as I mentioned earlier, you can establish a body similar to the rent smart Wales for uh, managing second homes and holiday lets. And it would then be good to see that body being located in somewhere such as Gwynedd, where we have an intense second home problem and based in local areas and rural areas that we can use our systems to manage second homes and holiday lets and then to bring jobs with it. And I would hope that Gwynedd would support that idea. Thank you. Um, we've got a lot of questions and not a lot of time. So if I could plead for fairly brief answers from the panelists, please. Um, next question is about national parks. So there's an anonymous attendee who said national parks attract larger numbers of second home buyers than other rural areas. Basically asking if the purpose of national park authorities should be changed to place a greater emphasis on protecting local communities and industries rather than helping entertain those who regard them as playgrounds. Tim, I'm going to come to you on that first as you have national parks in your patch. Yeah, um, so it's very interesting. So the Yorkshire Dales and the Lake District both expanded their boundaries in the last few years. Um, the Yorkshire Dales, controversially, into bits of Cumbria that were never Yorkshire. Um, <laughs> indeed, um, not quite my patch. It even took a bit of, you know, a bit of Lancashire, which is an aggressive foreign policy, if I ever heard it. Um, but the, the point is, a couple of very nice villages in my patch, Barbon and Casterton, they're not huge places. Uh, you look at the house prices, those villages have not changed one little bit in the last five years, really. Uh, they're as beautiful now as they were then, um, but they've now designated in a national park and suddenly they're more expensive places to live. And so, you know, I think that, that the landscape and the heritage of those communities justified them being in a national park? Absolutely. But we shouldn't be so naive as to recognise that this will be a consequence if you build that invisible wall around them. And so that's why I absolutely agree with the anonymous questioner that the, that, that kind of third sort of relegated priority of national parks to conserve and look after the economy and the community um, of the local area, um, that needs to be put right to the top. What's the point in protecting the heritage and the landscape of a place if you allow the community to go um, to rack and to ruin, and it only becomes, as, as is said by the questioner, a playground for those who've got plenty. So I think the, the, I mean, the Glover review is being responded to by the Westminster government now. It's all very vague, their response. There's lots of good things and lots of not so good things in the Glover review. The thing I desperately want to see happen, because I'm quite convinced there will be protection of the landscape, or fairly convinced, um, there are some issues about what the change in funding for farming actually might mean in reality, but that farming or you know the, the landscape might be protected from overdevelopment, I'm reasonably confident in that the um, community will be protected so it's not wiped out by um, you know holy let second homes and so on. I have no confidence whatsoever, and I think that before we are um, you know extending the boundaries of any national park, we need to be doing our homework on that beforehand, and we need to do our best to lock the stable door now. Um, to at least make sure we protect the communities we still have got in those national parks, because yeah, what's the point in having beautiful places to come and visit if the communities that are there are dead? Yeah, I mean, the good board and a lot yes, of... as it happened, I was a member of the National Park of Snowdonia National Park for some 20 years. And I have to say that the Snowdonia National Park is somewhat different to a number of other national parks that I've had experience of. And they are supportive of their local communities. They are supportive of the agricultural industry locally. Because for us, that's what the national park means it's our local communities that sustains the beauty that people wish to visit to a certain extent i think the concept of a national park has now become somewhat dated 
And please remember areas such as the Lleen Peninsula, where Rhys lives, isn't part of the National Park, but they are naturally outstanding areas of natural beauty. And that also attracts people and tourism. And the subject on tourism, I think, is an important one. And as a local authority, we've looked our, at our tourism strategy and we've spoken to people from Slovenia, from the USA, believe it or not, and from similar places, also Iceland. And we've seen plans um, with regards to sustainable tourism. Also, please remember, from the point of view of planning, the national park, there isn't that, that much, uh, the only small individual developments are permitted, and they don't have that much of an impression on the housing stock in general. There are certain limits um, within the national park compared to outside of the national park, but there's a problem with the current housing stock that doesn't come any sort of legislation that's the market that we are referring to here and that's the one that we need to tackle Greece national parks should they have more powers to protect local communities yes national parks i agree with the and the point that he made with regards to the national parks, local communities is what makes a national park. What's a pity is that the national parks that we have, somehow or another, do not protect our cultural wealth. We've now in a world where natural um, resources are respected. There's an emphasis on people to look after the natural, to look after the environment and the natural resources, but there is no emphasis whatsoever on cultural wealth that's not being given considered. There's a body in Wales called Enadablir. We don't have a body that represents culture, and there should be. Not only should we protect the environment, but we should also protect the, the communities and the people who live in those communities. And I think that the national parks shouldn't just exist for the views and the mountains, etc., and the natural resources, but it will also protect the fabric of society and communities. Thank you. Thank you. Um, next question about empty houses. We haven't really talked about empty houses too much. Should powers be given to councils to allow them to compulsorily purchase and renovate rural houses that have been left empty for long periods? Uh, Dofric, let's go to you first on that. Yeah, my uh, tag week on. Um... Yes, empty houses is a priority for every authority, I would have thought. We don't want to see empty houses. And the 100% premium that we've placed on second homes is also placed on empty houses. And I know that there has been a reaction to that from some residents who own such homes or houses. So we do have a number of schemes to encourage people to bring their empty houses back into use and to help them with costs that relate to refurbishment, for example, if needed. There are some powers that local authorities do have to do some compulsory purchases. But it's quite a complicated um, area of work, and I'm aware that we haven't undertaken a compulsory purchase for some time. But I do think that we do have a right to do that if we found ourselves in that situation. But also, of course, we have to look at whether we have the resources to do that. Thank you. Tim, do you have any thoughts on that? No, I mean, it's an issue with us. I guess, you know, if hold elects and second homes are fighting it out for first and second place for the major cause of um, uh, homes not being available for local people at any kind of an affordable price um then empty properties would be a, a distant but not inconsiderable third 
you know, in our district of about 50, 55,000 houses, 50,000 houses, um, then we reckon there's probably about 900 to 1,000 empty any given time, separate to second homes and holiday lets. And they are empty for all sorts of reasons. Sometimes it's probate issues, some, or whole, you know, maybe not a thousand different reasons, but certainly probably about 50. Um, and, and very often perfectly livable in properties in good places that for whatever reason uh, the owner doesn't occupy, doesn't make use of. So I think you've got to use uh, tax powers to make sure you bring them into use to kind of incentivize them being brought into use. We have in our local authority here made use of something called an empty dwelling management orders, which some of you will have come across. Um, it's a bit of a high bar to get over, but if you can get over it, then the local authority can requisition a property effectively uh, with one of these uh, empty dwelling management or, uh, orders. And essentially what you do is you make it um, a council property for seven years. Um, and once you've um, proved that it's being and lived in and that it could be better used in the local community, uh, then the council can take it over, renovate it, do what they need to do to bring it up to, you know, rentable uh, standard. Um, and then obviously out of the rent that you charge the social tenant that then moves in, um, whatever's left out over after the council's costs, then the landlord um, gets. We've done a handful of those. I mean, a real small handful of those they're really effective because when you do one, um, you know, the message goes around the landlord community like wildfire. And it's like, oh, blimey, we better do something with the ones we've got. Otherwise, we will this will be taken out of our hands. So I probably think we've done half a dozen tops. Um, but I think it's had an impact of bringing 50, 60 more properties that um, that we've not had to do anything with um, back into the market. Uh, and that's been a good thing. So I think but having, having the power to be able to bring an empty property back into use like that means that the, the the landlord is aware that they don't hold all the cards and have to do something with that property so yeah we need more powers like that thank you Greece yeah um I'm gonna say quick on um, yes, with regards to empty houses, I think in Gwynedd you have around a thousand um, empty houses, at least four times as many or five times as many um, um, holiday homes or second homes, and yet a thousand is a large number. And when we are pushing and going after the government and asking them that we need homes for local people, I think it's important then that we make use of these empty houses. There are ones that are empty for a number of reasons. They may not be quality, they may not, uh, they may be empty because they're empty and that's not correct. I applaud uh, Gwynedd Council because they have voted recently, and I think that was in March, to increase a the council's premium tax on empty houses, 100% higher than the normal council tax rate. And I think it's correct that they use that money in order to undertake plans to refurbish empty houses, to provide grants, and there is a need to do that, and it needs to be done at scale. Thank you. Um, next question from William Powell. So he says that we often think about this kind of issue in terms of younger people being priced out. Um, but with Brexit, there's a possibility that more farmers could be retiring. Um, do the panellists think we need to devise a rural on-farm affordable housing scheme to address this need among older people and their immediate families to retire with dignity? Um, Tim, I'll come to you first on that. Mm, yeah, I mean, I think that is a really good point. I mean, I. I know obviously the situation in Wales is is different, so forgive me if I say something which is perhaps not 100% relevant to most people on the call, but I, I, I think there'll be a lot of overlap. The the great concern I see DEFRA in Westminster um, kind of keen to use um, uh, transitional funding to encourage people to retire from the industry, and yet, you know, I, I see plenty of people working well into their 80s and they really shouldn't for their sake they shouldn't and um and you want to be able to allow them to retire with dignity i mean most of my farmers are tenant farmers um and so you, they just don't have anywhere to go a lot of them and the problem is though i mean obviously i care for those people and those families who should be able to retire with dignity 
but we don't want to be in a situation where we basically empty the industry. Um, people retire and there's no one to take them over. Um, and I'm deeply concerned there's a lack of any kind of a su succession planning um, uh, involves more than just allowing people to retire uh, with dignity and with some kind of an income. Uh, it means bringing people in at the front end as well. And I see no plan to do that, at least not from the UK uh, government. And my great concern, and I, I, what DEF for us talking about doing um, and moving towards environmental land management scheme, um, I think most people and most parties in Westminster kind of think, yeah, that's 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 about right. We think in principle, public money for public goods is a good thing. But the thing about the basic payment system um, is that for livestock farmers, it made up more than 80 percent of the farm income. Mm -hmm. And the gap between that being phased out and anything new coming in is just going to decimate. Um, lots of family farms um, who will just simply not be able to cling on. Who of us could exist without an income for two or three years when we we're already earning a pittance to start off with? And and that's so I don't think the government's eventual plan is particularly bad, but I think they are, for the sake of what well, is basically a few quid, botching the handover. So some of this money will be helping people to retire and good for them, um, but there'll be nothing to help fill the gap. And what that means for what our landscapes will look like in the future could be really quite terrifying. I mean, we the the the, the, the nature of the, land, of the landscape in the Yorkshire Dales and the Lake District isn't accidental. It's it's maintained by by farmers over centuries, and it's it is part of our cultural heritage, um, and it's also important to our environment as well as to the fact that it's a, the way we produce food for the whole of the country. And I, I'm so I'm deeply concerned that uh, we're we are accidentally doing something that could drastically change the landscape of, of the UK and certainly uh, my part of it and and not thinking I mean, if the government were deliberately wanting to do this I disagree but at least I'd understand the fact that it seems to be done by accident is incredibly infuriating and um, and again uh, as I think has been mentioned by I think Reese earlier on but the idea that we look at farm settlements as potentials to develop small scale affordable housing on site using you, you disuse as underused farm buildings so you've got new affordable settlements you know um to create sustainability a house to retire into a house where the young couple can begin life maybe others in the local community you just begin to build a, a sustainable community new hamlets if you like those are the things we should be doing planning law should be stacked in favor of farmers and farming families to do that and we need to remember, you know, as I said, um, that a very large proportion of our farming families are tenants and just advantaging people who own the land and the buildings won't help most people who are involved in farming and won't help to bring new people in. Reese, what do you think? How do we make sure that older farmers are properly housed? Well, something more. A point I, I would have thought that Tim, the point the has already been suggested by Tim and Doing he mentioned that. it now, um, and that is to help the possibility for farmers to be able to turn um, um, a barn um, into a home and possibly you would want to limit that in order to stop overdevelopment in local areas but why can't they have um, a home for their son or for themselves when they retire and that should be permitted within national planning applications it's unfair that they are not allowed to do that but they are allowed to build a holiday or accommodation because farmers and the families like to be close together in rural areas it's very sad actually that they are not allowed to build a home on their farm unless a significantly large scale farming that would then be permitted but with small scale farming it may be too small and it may not be possible when it comes to planning applications and why not? Why can't you allow that possibility to happen? And then that home would have a condition on it that it should be for the use of people locally and it should remain in the hands of the community. If the family, for example, leave the farm or if they are tenants and there's no certainty that they will be there in future, but at least then the home that has been built if the planning legislation were changed would remain in the hands of local people.
Uh, Victor, on this? Yeah, that just at a point in that. Yeah, just on that point, there are policies in place that do permit rural businesses, and that includes agriculture and also beyond agriculture, to be allowed or permitted to build a home, and that would be conditional on a number of factors. Yes, we are supportive to, of that idea of permitting farmers to be able to build on their own land is quite strange, actually, that they're not allowed to do that. Of course, with some sort of limit on it, and I agree with Rhys, you have to have appropriate planning restrictions in place in order to stop overdevelopment happening and stopping things from going on the open market, for example. It's interesting, actually, when you talk about farmers retiring. Farmers don't always, or from my experience, they don't retire they tend to go on forever. And I think the average age of a farmer is way over 65. And I'm sure that you as a union have those figures and they're probably closer to 70. But one encouraging thing, I was speaking the, the other day to one of our colleges here in North Wales, the number of students who now go into agricultural courses is actually increasing which gives us a flicker of hope, I think, for the future of the industry in extremely uncertain times. And I am concerned that the current government do not have a, a, an understanding or sympathy, unfortunately, towards rural issues. And this continual message that we as local authorities, especially the rural forum, we convey that message to the portfolio ministers that they have to have policies in place that are aimed specifically towards our rural areas. And I think that's an important message that we need to convey to government. And I hope that the forum will continue to lobby and pressure for that sort of attitude towards our rural areas. Okay, we've got about five minutes left and I'd like to get two questions in, if we can at all, please. So very brief answers, if possible. Uh, first question on inheritance tax. Should the inheritance tax system be looked at to favor those who pass properties on with conditions attached about their use in local communities? Rhys, what do you think about that? Yeah, question. Uh, yes, that's a good question. question. I was trying to, thinking of the question in this context. How could inheritance tax could actually work in order to try and take control of the housing market? I can't think of the top of my head how that could actually be um, worked for the benefit of our rural communities at the moment. But of course, people can inherit a significant sum of money. We know that. It's more than what it's um, been previously, of course. A married couple, for example, can inherit over 650. Um, and in addition to that, they can be exempt with regards to their um, property, which is an 80,000. So all of these exceptions in places such as Abersoch is equal to the price of a home. So to be honest with you, I don't actually know what the answer would be to that question. How could we actually use inheritance tax more effectively for local communities? Certainly, land tax is something that we could use, and I think that could be used effectively and something that you could put in place immediately and it would effectively deal with the problem. But with regards to inheritance tax, I think that's a little bit more complicated. And of course, it's a way of people um, being able to avoid um, putting their, their all sorts of loopholes that can be. But I think with land tax, then we need to close the loopholes. It's been exactly in existence now for a century. So the loopholes have been closed to a certain extent. Tim, any thoughts? Very brief ones. Yeah, well, very briefly. Yes, I think we you know, the market um, works against local affordable housing and in favour of those with plenty of money. You've got to 
stack the rules um, in order to level the playing field and all the other euphemisms. And it, it seems to me that inheritance tax is one way in which you can seriously advantage people who do the right thing and um, come down rel relatively heavily on those who, who don't. Catherine? Yeah, doing Katie. <laughs> My yes, I think we have to and we need to look at all sorts of different interventions, whether that be inheritance tax or not. I think Rhys is quite right. He has explained the complexity of the inheritance tax, but if it's possible to do something via the inheritance tax, then that's fine. Let us use it. But there are more direct taxation schemes that could be used, I think, could have more of an impression on the housing market in the short term. Okay, one final question. Um, I hope the audience will forgive me for stealing one for myself. I have tried to get as many questions in from you as possible. Um, a question for you, Rhys, first of all. What would you say to the Welsh Conservative spokesperson on housing, Janet, Janet Finch Saunders, who said housing campaigners are creating a hostile situation and threatening the tourism industry, which is valuable to Wales? Sorry, just to date and blind, but I would just say quite plainly well, that it's total it's nonsense. And, 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 um, it's not frightening when it comes to tourism. People come here to visit an area. What we need, we need sustainable tourism. People who come here for a period of time but don't take ownership of property. Because I don't have a problem with caravan parks. There's one near to where I live. Have on so a more, as it's called, that doesn't affect the Welshness of an area such as Pocheli and Hwilog. And there are jobs okay, there for local people, and okay? They don't pay particularly well, well as Kavrig mentioned that, because those salaries tend to be very low, probably the lowest throughout the whole of Wales. But we need to emphasise what we are after, we want sustainable tourism. We need visitors. But in truth, Ruth, someone who takes ownership of property to live in that property for a few weeks a year is not an actual visitor in the true sense of the word. Those are people who have taken ownership of property. And okay, they do visit from time to time, but they shouldn't be allowed to take ownership of property. And I think that's what's totally unfair that someone is allowed to live in uh, a room for a couple of weeks, perhaps among some of the nicest homes that we have in our communities, the house prices are increased because of it, and local people can't afford to pay for that. It's totally immoral and unjust and unfair. We need to emphasise that we are trying to tackle that problem, and the parties, such as the Tory party, they try to make it into a campaign against tourism. We haven't got a problem with tourism. We haven't got a problem with people who buy and sell homes because that's something that's quite legal to do. You can sell for a particular price or whatever price that you want. But what I don't like is that there's no way of controlling or managing to give local people fairness. There's nothing available to provide that. There's a council tax, yes. But there is nothing in addition to try and regulate the housing market, unfortunately, and that's a disaster. Thank you for that. We are one minute over, so unfortunately I'm going to have to wrap things up now. These events always go through quickly and I'm sure we could keep asking lots of questions. I know there are lots that we haven't managed to answer and we're really sorry about that. But you can all go and put your feet up now and have a cup of tea. Uh, just before we sign off, I'd like to thank all of our speakers, Dr. Rick, Tim and Rhys. A big round of virtual applause for you. And finally, thanks to all of you for joining us today. I really hope you've enjoyed the session.